do appreciate that very much. Praise to the Lord, and thank you, Ryan, for singing that to uh, our congregation today. And we're going to continue. Today we have a, a special message that was suggested by one of our members here, and we will record it and make it available to others as well. This is a topic that comes in our series on the great controversy, and it is the topic of the triumph over death. Uh, we'll uh, show you a little bit of, um, of the beginning of this, and we understand that this subject is of great interest to all, um, all of us. We all experience the natural consequences of, of death, and different cultures will approach this in different ways. As we can see here from this picture, it's from the Orient. You can tell there's a, something of a Buddha in the middle there. And uh, they emphasize worship of their ancestors. And they do it in a way that is way beyond what any of us have done. We have in this country uh, something that's called Decoration Day. And, and I've seen people go to the cemeteries and, and place flowers and make sure that the grave is in good condition to let people know that they have not forgotten their loved ones, but it holds no candle to the presentations that you will see in the Oriental countries as they bring food and, and numbers of things there to the grave to see, uh, to in some sense ha believe that, that their loved one is looking over them. And, um, as you were saying, Mary, in, in the children's story, how that we kind of have to hear God's voice speaking behind us, they sense that their loved ones, their ancestors, are behind them, guiding their lives in some way. And so that's one sense of the immortality. And uh, here you can see a picture of them gathered there in a celebration of the person's life. And uh, on a periodic basis, they would come back. We also recognize in... Uh, our own culture that the appeal of fame is the desire to be immortalized. Here's a, a representation of Marilyn Monroe and uh, Joe DiMaggio as they were married back in 1954. Sadly, of course, their marriage did not last very long, um, but it was it was highly touted, very popular in in those days, and. Uh, Many of the people here, even in the congregation, would remember Joe DiMaggio as a baseball player and uh, very well known at the time. And Marilyn Monroe, of course, has lived on kind of in infamy. Uh, we can see videos of her on the internet to this day. So that sense of, of wanting to, to immortalize oneself is the, is the driving force behind fame. And then we can... Um, Go back many years further to the time of uh, Ponce de Leon as he came to this new world in search of the fountain of youth. And never found it. He's dead. Now he's dead. But we would, you know, we'd love to have it. I, uh, I, was, I was listening to a, a thing on, on, uh, on a, a YouTube video that there, were, there was a little girl who has not matured. She, she is the age of my son, but she looks like she's 16 months old. It's an incredible thing. And they're hoping that they can find some genetic thing that they can manipulate so that they can use it and extend people's lives so that they stay. But you know, I think there's, they're, they're gonna be mistaken on that. And um, this search for the fountain of youth didn't turn up anything. The map to the fountain of youth is actually in the Bible. The, the uh, source of our life, the evidence for the resurrection, the promise of uh, re rejuvenated and revitalized bodies is all right here in this book. And so we're going to take uh, some time to look at some of the Bible verses today that build this story, that give us uh, the, the story of the fountain of youth as it is 
uh, reveal. The road begins in the book of Genesis. Uh, there we find the world created in perfection. There we find uh, the story of how that God made a, a beautiful place for uh, his children to live. And it also gives, provides the, the key that helps us to understand the secret of life and also um, to unravel the secret of death and, and what it means. So we go back to Genesis and we find there um, the beginning of this notion of immortality, the immortality of the soul. I put this up here uh, for those of you that like language. This is a picture of uh, the woman with the serpent and he says to her, and this is the Hebrew, lo mit ti ma Timatun, which is, you can see the, the similarity of the characters there. It's a duplication of the word mot, which is, which is the word for die. Lo means not. So lo mot, you will not die, die. Repetition of the die means certainty. And he declared to her on that day, in opposition to what, Jesus, what God had said to them, that if they ate of the fruit, they would die, he said, no, you will not surely die. And so in the words of the serpent, we find the beginning of the concept of the immortality of the soul. And there, there are societies, theosophy, and in other societies, uh, the Luciferian society that say, he was right. Spiritualism, which got its... It's uh, beginning in the 1800s um, and, and really got its largest boost during the Civil War, believes that when you die, you don't really die. It's just the change. In fact, a lot of times when we, we talk, use the m euphemisms for death, well, we use some of the phrases that come from spiritualism. He has passed on. As if, you know, you're in this life and then you have another life, so you pass on. Um, the, the, these euphemisms are a denial of the reality of death. And it brings some comfort to some people. My dear, dearly beloved person is, is not, a, n not unconscious, not uh, unaware of what's going on, but is in a different state somewhere. And this is uh, of, of concern to us. We look for its roots and we go back further uh, in history to the time of the pharaohs and the pharaoh worship and the immortality of the soul, the, the whole notion of, of preserving the, the body and, and putting all of these implements and, and wealth and all of that sort of thing in the tomb. Uh, it seems rather wasteful, except for the idea that somehow they can use these things in the next world. When they found uh, King Tut's tomb, which, is, which was a bit of a marvel, um, very early, what was it, in the early 20th century, um, the, uh, it was a marvel because most of the graves had been robbed. The wealth had been robbed, even sometimes moving the the mummies outside of, the, of it, and they found this uh, remarkable uh, cache of all of these things, and, and King Tut, uh, Tutankhamun, was not the most wealthy of all of the pharaohs, and yet uh, the wealth that was buried with him was amazing. One of the things that was buried with him was this enormous boat, as if he could take it to travel to the netherworld. And so, um, the, the Egyptians had this notion of, of preserving their pharaohs that they would live on forever in another world. Um, and uh, so it, this is one of the beginning points for it. We follow the notion of the immortality of the soul to the Greeks and we find Plato. Um, and this he is attributed to say, the soul of man is immortal and imperishable. That there is something within us. There is a soul within us that uh, does not die. The body dies, but it goes on. And that is a, a notion that has been carried into even Judaism and into Christianity today. 
But if we go to the scriptures, we find that God made mortal man as a whole person. It's not, not segments that can live apart from other parts, but they're, they're, they're parts that go together. I used uh, some different illustrations trying to tell this in, uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, so I'm going to grab the microphone here and move, o move over so I can do this for you. Um, I talked about how that uh, uh, when you sit down, when you sit down, you have a lap, right? And um, as long as you're s seated, you have a lap. I, I was very fond of being able to sit in my mom's lap as a child. You know, it was a place of comfort, okay? So you have a lap that uh, exists under certain circumstances. And what is that? That your legs are this way and your back is this way, right? And so I, I was showing this to them and I, uh, when I bent down, I forgot that I kept my hand cleaner because uh, they didn't have much water over there in Ethiopia and I, I sh shook a lot of hands and so I had this hand sanitizer and when I went down, I broke the bottle. <laughs> And there, I could feel it oozing down my leg. <laughs> and they were, they, when I, I pulled out the bottle and they realized what it happened, they were all just laughing you know, about it. But, but my, my point is this, that a lap exists under a very specific situation. When you're down like this, you have a lap when you sit down. When you stand up, where does your lap go? It, it requires certain circumstances. Well, we're going to look at the circumstances that are required for the whole person. And we get this from Scripture. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, And the Lord God made man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we've got, just like my lap, we have two conditions that are necessary. What are those conditions? Well, first of all, we've got to have dust. Dust is, is the stuff that we're made of. Um, Carl Sagan says we're made of stardust. Well, whatever kind of dust we're made out of, it's dust. It's just the elements of the earth reconstituted in different forms to create all the life on the planet. But it isn't just dust, is it? You know, there was a little boy one day that he was, he had heard this, this message in, in church and he came running out to his mama He's, and he had been peering under his bed and he saw all the dust under his bed. He said, mama, mama, somebody's under there either coming or going. <laughs> it's not just dust. Okay, it's not just dust. It's dust plus the spirit or the breath of life, same word in, in the Hebrew, ruach. Sounds like it's kind of blowing, doesn't it? Ruach. <laughs> you know, ruach. And so it's dust plus the spirit, but it isn't just, just air, right? It isn't just air. It's the breath of life. There's this, this spark of, of life that, that only God can give. And those two together make the living soul. Okay? So this is the, the two together. So the dust is the elements of the earth. And then God added to that the breath of life. And then he became a living being. That's in, in some translations actually word it that way. So the, the origin of the word soul uh, in, um, let's see, what is it in Hebrew? In Greek, it's, um, what is it in Greek? I know the word pneuma is breath, but um, suke in Greek, yeah, is, is, the, is the soul. But it's, it, it is this word that is translated both being and soul. And you will find it often used in, the, in that sense. Uh, even today, uh, when they talk about uh, transit uh, across the Atlantic, so many souls 
a board. They're not talking about, you know, that there's, they left their bodies back in, in London and, and their souls just carried across in the, uh, the Atlantic. They're talking about the whole person, right? So a whole person. Beings, people. So dust plus the spirit of God creates the living soul. And this is the, this is the biblical concept of it as opposed to the, uh, the Greek thinking about an immortal soul as we saw from Plato. All right, so we move on to understand, well then, what is death? Death is creation in reverse. You see, here, you see here represented God uh, hovering over this form of Adam in the, the, the dust of the ground, forming him from it. I have a picture up here of a, of a fading flower, just to kind of remind you of, of that element in life that we know occurs. Death is, is part of life, and it's part of the cycle that we know today. I could have put a dead person up there, but I thought a fading flower was a better symbol, don't you think? Okay, y you've seen enough dead people, you know what that, that, that's about. But death is creation in reverse. And we go to the book of Ecclesiastes, and he uses the very terms that we saw in Genesis to show just the reversal of the process. process. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So spirit returns to God who gave it. Now, some people say, oh, oh, well, that's where the soul goes back up to God, or that's where the spirit goes up back up to God. And, um, and with the notion that we get from the Egyptians and the Greek thinking and so on, it, it seems like, okay, well, that's what it's talking about. But if we go to just to scripture, we find that Jesus said when he was on the cross, uh, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Well, same, same word. The breath, he gave up, he breathed his last, as we might say in, in common vernacular. He commended his spirit to God. So where did his spirit go? To God, all right? His spirit went to God. The life that kept him alive went returned to God who gave it, as Ecclesiastes says. Mm -hmm. It's Yes, that would be a way to say it, the spark of life. Now, on the day of the resurrection, when he ran into Mary there, what did he tell her? Had he gone back to God? Well, notice the words. Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Well, his spirit went to God who gave it. But he says he didn't go. So how, you know, if, if the real you is your spirit, if the real you is your soul in, in, in teaching it the way that we have heard it, then he would have said, I've been there. But he didn't. Because even our Savior, when he died, relinquished his spirit to God, but he didn't go. As a matter of fact, it, this is not something that I had put up on the slides, but if you read about uh, what Jesus did when he died, um, quoting from the Psalms, Peter, Peter describes uh, the Messiah, and he said uh, um, that God would not leave his holy one in hell. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, that's a Hebrew parallelism. It's saying the same thing. His soul in hell and his flesh seeing corruption are not talking about two separate things. Hell, everybody, when they die, goes to hell. That may seem like a shock to some people. But everybody goes to hell because hell is Sheol, which is the grave. 
everybody goes to the grave. Jesus went to the grave. And there, what did he do? Well, we'll talk about what do you do when you die and what don't you do when you die. All right, so we've clarified just this one point, and that is that when the Spirit goes back to God who gave it, if, if Jesus is our example, he, he is saying he didn't go. His Spirit, that gift of life that, was, that made the dust that was formed into a man into a living soul, returns to God who gave it. Uh, a simple illustration of this is like uh, the light bulb. Here we have a light bulb. It's, it's got everything to make a light bulb work. Shake it. It doesn't rattle. It's still good. You know, Plug it in. right? Screw it into its, its socket. And then what do you need? That spark. Yeah, that spark. So boom. Then you've got light. All right? As long as the bulb is intact and the electricity is flowing through it, you have light. Now, if you break the bulb, you can put all the light, you know, all the electricity through it, and you're not going to have light, are you? And the same thing is true of our bodies. You know, if they are broken to the point that you, you, know, you could put all the electric juice to it, it's not going to make it work. You can blow air into it, and blowing air into it doesn't keep it alive. So it's these two together. A working body and the life that God gives. And then the light goes out. But is that the end? Is that the end? Well, let's take a look at scripture. There, here are some key scriptures that tell us what doesn't a person do in death. Okay? What doesn't a person do in death? We'll do the what he does afterwards. But let's do what he doesn't do first. Okay, so what doesn't a person do in death? Well, here's a first uh, passage that we can look at from the Psalms. Psalm 146.4. His breath goeth forth. Okay, that the, the breath goes forth. The spirit, same, same uh, Hebrew word. He returneth to his earth in that very day his thoughts perish. So what doesn't he do if his thoughts perish? He doesn't think. Okay? All right, what else? Well, here's from Ecclesiastes 9.5. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So what else don't they do? No thoughts. They don't know anything. So you can understand why it, God was very much against uh, necromancy in the Old Testament. You know what necromancy is? Consulting or worshiping the dead. You know, the, the notion that you can, you can learn secrets from the dead, that they will reveal to you something. You know, that, but here the Bible says they don't know anything. So if you're asking and you're getting answers, then you're not getting answers from them, somebody else has tapped into the line and is giving you answers. Now, some of you may have had some experiences or done some reading of people that have communicated with the dead. This is what is known as spiritualism. That was their big um, uh, advantage or, or um, attraction during the Civil War because there were so many homes during the Civil War that lost people, young people, you know, in the prime of life and the, in the agony that the families went through, many people turned to spiritualism and that, that gave rise to its, its popularity in the world. And they had experiences, real experiences. Now, uh, I've read some of the accounts and maybe you have read some of the accounts about some of the charlatans that were involved in the spiritualistic movement back before the turn of the century in the early 20th century and how that they, they figured out ways to, to trick people, you know, that they would have tables that would levitate that were manipulated in some way. And um, even the Fox sisters who were supposedly up there in, in upstate New York who began this notion of, of the uh, spiritualism, who had 
had some communication with what they thought was a dead peddler in their house that made rappings and answered their, their questions on the wall. You know, they hear these sounds. Even they developed ways of making their toes crack and making noises and stuff to perpetuate their show as people would see it. But mixed in with all of these, uh, all of this spiritualistic um, chicanery and, and um, stuff that was just made up and manipulated, there were real experiences that people had. People saw things that were uncanny. People, uh, there were um, mediums that had knowledge that exceeded what you could find just researching a person in the newspaper. Uh, there were th things that were uncanny, and yet it was sometimes hit and miss. Sometimes it was good in information, sometimes not. And enough that with people's desire to want to know, you know, is my loved one okay, they would pursue it. And so it has, it has lingered on. Even to this day, you see um, personalities on the television who, who talk about going beyond and, and communicating with the dead and, and people come in the audience and, and they say, you know, what happened to my loved one? And they say, well, I'm sensing there was a body of water. And, you know, and, they, and they go through different things. And I don't know whether they've verified much of what they've said, but what it does for the people is it gives them some sense of closure and finality and comfort. And so people are drawn to this. But when we look to the word of God, it says thoughts perish, they know nothing. And what else? Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Now, that's just the opposite of what you would think. And what is, you know, they're up there in the heavenly choir singing, you know. They, they, they couldn't carry a tune down here, but they're up there singing away, you know. And that gives some people great comfort, you know, in one way or another. And, and so, uh, but that's not what scriptures tells us. It doesn't say that they are there. We have gotten that. We have imported those notions from other, other sources. So what does a person do in death? All right, well, let's let the answer come from the scriptures again. What does a person do in death? Well, here's one from Revelation. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Rest. Now, isn't that a comfort? If you've had a loved one who's been struggling, who's, had, who's been through a, 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 a very uncomfortable illness, isn't rest a good idea? God provides rest. Notice, though, that it says they rest from their labors, but their works do follow them. You know, as opposed to what Ecclesiastes was saying about the, the memory of them is forgotten. No, not when a person has invested in people for the future. Not when a person who has been a blessing to others, their works follow them. They continue in a different sense. People continue to, to look back and remember what that person has done. You know, I talk about it uh, periodically here in the pulpit that I carry my dad right here. You know, I have this, this strong sense of what he invested in me, what he told me, uh, counsels that he made and encouragements and support that he gave of me. And I carry him with me. And I look forward to the time when God will bring him back to life again. But until then, his works do follow him. And we can look to the, our loved ones, and, and even though we have sad partings, we can look at what God has done through their lives, what they have accomplished. The, the memory of them is not forgotten. Their works do follow them. What else? Well, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. They sleep. They rest. That's a good thing. Um, really good sleep, you, you're not aware of the passage of time. Bad sleep, you're kind of aware of everything. 
or at least uh, sort of, you know, you hear off and on, you know, you can hear noises, you, you can, uh, you know, my mom, mom said one time she, she, she thought somebody was calling her name, and she's asleep, she woke up, she, she, it was Doris, Doris, and when she realized it was her own snoring, she <laughs> woke herself up, you know. It's, it's not a pleasant sleep, you know, when, you're, when it's broken. But a pleasant sleep, it's like the time just went by. And that's what God wants to give. It is a blessing. And then we look at one, one further verse, and this one is uh, Job. He says, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. It's a time of waiting. But waiting for what? God's got something in store. God's got something in, in, in much better than even what we have experienced in this life, as wonderful as many of the experiences are that we have, the relationships that we enjoy. God has much more. And Job, writing way back when, and this is one of the earliest written books of, of the Old Testament, he recognized that there was something more. We could look at some other verses in Job where he talked about the resurrection. We could also look um, to some of the other passages in, um, and I was going to bring those up, and what did I do with that? I wrote it down. I just, no. Nope. Yes, here it is. Um, in Psalm 16, verse 10, if you'd like to turn there, this is the notion that, that God has something more, even in Old Testament times. You know, there are some Jews who don't believe in a resurrection. Yeah, we call them pretty sad. Th that's the Sadducees, because they, they didn't recognize the resurrection. But they could have um, if they had looked to Job, if they had looked to Psalm, Psalm chapter 16, verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And that, as we've already said, Peter applied to the Messiah. Psalm 49 and verse 15. Psalm 49, verse 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. He's talking about the bodily resurrection. Isaiah chapter 26, Isaiah 26, verse 19. Let's see here. You guys are getting there faster with your little devices. My, I'm, I'm doing the old-fashioned kind here with the pages. Isaiah 26 and verse 19, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So this is the, about the description of the resurrection, and we can find others in Daniel and Hosea 13, 14. And I think I have a couple of those up here on the screen, so I'll move to those. But we notice that uh, the scriptures describe this, uh, the experience of, of death as a sleep. You notice as far back as Deuteronomy 31, 16. Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And the whole notion of sleep is that you're going to wake up, right? So it's why, comparing death to sleep is that you're going to wake up. And, and, and then you move on to other passages that uh, describe the same thing. Second Samuel 7.12, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. First Kings 121, sleep with thy fathers. Again, Psalm 13, verse 3, sleep the sleep of death. Or uh, we also find in Daniel 12, 2, them that sleep in the dust. John 11, 11, going to the words of Jesus, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. And they said, oh, that's good because he'll, uh, he'll, he'll recover. You know, it's good to, to have a sleep when you're sick. And, and Jesus said, well, you're not getting it. And he said plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he understood that he was going to wake him out of his sleep. And he did it during their lifetime, but God has another day that he will raise the dead, wake them again. First Thessalonians 4.14, them also which sleep in Jesus. 
I never heard the term until I was uh, almost an adult and did some reading. People uh, accused Seventh-day Adventists of, uh, of misrepresenting the scripture. And uh, they called this teaching that we have been looking at the Bible, right? This is, this is not, I'm not reading out of an Adventist book. I'm reading, well, unless you recognize that the Bible is an Adventist book. It is. It's about Jesus' return. It's about the hope, blessed hope. This is an Adventist book. But it's also everybody else's book, right? And it's this book that we've been looking at, and they call this term soul sleep. I had never heard that before. Well, it, it doesn't ever say that the soul sleeps. It just says that the person sleeps. But the person is the soul. Oh, okay, well... So I learned something from some uh, from a cri critic about the truth. And their notion is that they're not aware that they are reading into the scriptures. Now, why do they read into the scriptures? It's what they grew up with. And when we look at some other passages from with a certain pair of glasses, we may see it the way that they see it. But if we look at it through the lens that we have been just fabricating here from scripture we see uh, a different picture and so I want to take us to understand the nature of man man is mortal what does that mean that's it man is mortal that means he's subject to death he can die now if you say the death isn't death then what are you saying then man is immortal. But that defies what Scripture says, because if we, we turn to Job, he says, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? He would say, Shall immortal man? But man is not immortal. He is mortal. Then, okay, who is immortal? If man is mortal... God is the only one who is immortal. In fact, we find this text in, in Paul's writings, who only have immortality, speaking of God, dwelling in the light which no man can approach. This is not talking about a man having immortality. So God is the only one who has immortality, according to Scripture. Then how do we get this life that goes on and on? Romans 6.23, that beautiful passage of Paul. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have it inherently. We don't have a soul that can't die. It just keeps on going in one form or another, either in bliss or in torture, in torment. No, we don't have that. We have a mortal soul. We are mortal beings, and we receive eternal life as a gift from Jesus. Have you received that gift? Have you turned to him and said, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve the gift of eternal life, but I believe you love me, that you sent your son to die for me, and that you have given me this wonderful gift of eternal life. I receive it by faith. That's the gospel. And the, the story about life and death is about where you ha have decided to, to live now and where you will be in eternity. Will you be alive forever with Jesus and enjoying his presence and his blessing? Or will you not be alive forever? The opposite of life is death. The wages of sin is death. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And that word perish is about totally ceasing to be. You can look it up. I think it's uh, Greek number... Well, I'm not going to try to test my memory here. You can look it up in, in your Strong's Concordance and you will see that perish is about ceasing to be but God doesn't want that for you he wants you to live for eternity 
in a different system than we are in today. So it's a gift. And uh, we, we find out in 1 Corinthians 15 when that gift is given. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, you see the question up there? When? When shall we all be changed? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That's when Jesus comes. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He's picturing two here, two groups. Those who lay down in the sleep of death. They sleep in Jesus. We'll see, we saw that in 1 Thessalonians 4.14. But then there's another group, the we. He was hoping to be in that group that would be alive to see Jesus come. And there would be a transformation, a transformation at the last trump. And we continue reading in, in the next verse. It says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. In, in other words, we don't have it inherently. It's got to be put on. This mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is thy sting O grave where is thy victory what beautiful words of triumph now keep that in mind Keep that time frame in mind when you go to 2 Corinthians. Because there's a passage there that some have understood through this other lens that was granted from the immortality of the soul, from the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans. In 2 Corinthians 5.4, Paul is talking about this body and it, 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 he calls it a tabernacle. It's a place where we live. Now, the tabernacle is a dwelling place. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. I was, I was listening to a, a comedian who's now in his 40s. Bless his heart. He's in his 40s. And he was talking about every time that he gets up from sitting down, <laughs> he groans now <laughs> in his 40s. Bless his heart. We do in this tabernacle groan, <laughs> you know. Um, they talk about as you get older, you know, um, that when you go down to tie your shoelaces, you look around to see if there's something else to do while you're down there. <laughs> you know, it takes a little more effort to get up and down, right? We do groan. Paul says, in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now, keep in mind what we learned in 1 Corinthians 15. When is mortality swallowed up in immortality? At the last trump. When Jesus comes and he makes the transformation of those who are, are sleeping and those who are alive. That's when this takes place, the key element. So uh, somebody says, well, but, but isn't this talking about death? No. First uh, Corinthians was written just maybe a month or so before Second Corinthians. They had the letter. They knew the timetable. They, they knew of this. And so when they read Second Corinthians 5, they recognized that immortality comes when Christ comes, not at the moment of death. And then we read that passage that has brought mistaken comfort in the Christian world. 2 Corinthians 5.8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When? The question is when? Well, we, we just discovered that in death, you don't think, you don't praise the Lord. You do rest you do wait, and so we wait for God's timetable, and that's when we'll be present with the Lord. Now, perhaps you could, use, you could stretch this a little bit further and say that we are always in the presence of the Lord. Always. In the psalm, David said, 
Whither shall I go from thy spirit? I can't get away from you. If I go up into heaven or if I go into, into the earth, you are there. So you're never apart from the Lord in that sense. But when does the change take place? When Jesus comes. When Jesus comes. So we find that God's love and his truth conquer death. Remember, the God who knew you before you even, even conceived and had the wisdom to, to make your body within your mother's womb and to make all other things in the universe, that God who has that wisdom has the wisdom to reconstitute you through the resurrection as we see the thing, there we go, also has the wisdom to bring you back to life when Jesus comes. If you ever have any question, if you ever have any doubt about the reality of what is to come, think of two things. The first is that if he's smart enough to put it together the first time, he's smart enough to put it back together again. And then think of one other thing. And that is that Jesus has already gone there before. Jesus conquered death. The hope of the resurrection is built on his resurrection. God brought him forth from the tomb. He did not suffer his holy one to uh, um, see corruption in Sheol, in the grave. And so he will bring us forth. As we close our message today, I invite you to turn in your hymnal to number 428 as we sing about the reality of that in the song, Sweet By and By. Shall we stand as we sing? There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the
to bow our heads in prayer. Lord in heaven, thank you for the word from your 